Well, here we are on a Sabbath, uh, more than halfway through August, and it is four weeks from today is the beginning of the fall holy days. Four weeks from today is trumpets, the Feast of Trumpets. And how quickly, as I said a moment ago, this year has gone by, and how quickly the summer is going by as well. So we have the Feast of Trumpets that's coming up, which we all know pictures the return of Jesus Christ, and his return is going to rescue mankind from self-destruction and usher in a, the government of God on this earth. And then following that is the Day of Atonement. And it, we all know that that pictures the binding and putting away of uh, Satan, who is the arch enemy of both man and God. And we look forward to the actual uh, fulfillment of these two days. And then we come to the Feast of Tabernacles, uh, which we all look forward to throughout the year. Uh, it seems like that each year when we conclude the feast, we can't wait for the next feast to come around. And even though it's typically a year later, uh, we, we, we long to go back to that environment that we just spent eight days at. So the Feast of Tabernacles following atonement, and we know that it pictures the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And it, and it does picture the beginning of the restoration of all things. Uh, it's a process that will take place. But when Christ returns to the earth, his throne is established it begins a restoration process. And then we, we know that following that millennial period is the great harvest. And that is pictured by the eighth day, or we refer to it as the last great day. So these days that we celebrate each and every year should create an excitement for all of us. Uh, I'm quite excited to go to New Zealand for the feast. And it'll be 42 years. Uh, since Nancy and I were there when we were first married. So I'm looking forward to going back to New Zealand. I can't say as I'm looking forward to the 20 hours or so it takes to get there, uh, but when we get there, I'm, I'm sure that we will quickly forget that and begin to enjoy uh, our experience in New Zealand. But each and every year as these days approach, we look forward to the fulfillment and the ushering in of God's government on earth. We sometimes refer to it as the kingdom of God. And while the millennium is not technically the kingdom of God, it will be ruled by Jesus Christ and the saints who are a part of God's kingdom. But when we think about the times and the days that are ahead, we all know that the journey to get there is not an easy one. In fact, the path, the Bible tells us, is very difficult. Difficult for God's people. And if you think about it in terms of what Matthew, or sorry, what Jesus Christ is, was recorded saying <clears throat> in the prophecies that are laid out in Matthew 24, uh, the difficulty is worldwide. But we do, as God instructs us, we pray daily that God's kingdom would come. And I think all of us pray that earnestly. I know that as the years have gone on, it seems more and more urgent that that kingdom come, that God's government come to the earth. And so we do pray daily. But do we ever think about, as we pray that that day and that time is fulfilled, do we ever think about the difficulty that we are going to go through in order to get to the end of that journey? If you would, turn with me to an interesting scripture that's uh, found over in Acts chapter 14. Turn to Acts chapter 14. And I'm going to break into a, a thought or the context of what is recorded here. <clears throat> but I want to pick up this one comment that's found in verse 22 of Acts chapter 14. Acts 14 and in verse 22. So picking up midway through the, the verse, it says, strengthening the souls of the disciples, exhorting them to continue in the faith and saying, we must, through many tribulations, enter the kingdom of God. Now, how often have we read that verse 
And have we really stopped to think about that for a moment? Have you ever meditated on that verse? We must, through many tribulations, enter in to the kingdom of God. You notice Paul doesn't say that we may have tribulation. It's possible. Uh, he doesn't say, well, there's a good chance that some of you may go through tribulation or trials. Uh, he doesn't say it's possible that some will and some won't. But no, Paul actually says we must. We must. It's an interesting thought to meditate upon as that part of the journey for us to take and as we go through our days as a disciple of Jesus Christ that God tells us that there is going to be difficulty. There are going to be trials and there are going to be tribulations. And certainly we know, again, referencing back to Matthew chapter 24, the whole world is going to face a tribulation. But Paul knew a lot about having to go through trials. He knew a lot firsthand about suffering. And he knew firsthand about the difficulties that the walk of a Christian is. And it's a part of a, a journey. It's a part of a walk that Paul walked. And through his example and through what he and other of God's men tell us, it is the walk that every Christian is going to go through. We can say that being, being human, we're going to face trials. You know, and, if, and I've, as I've thought about it, it doesn't matter whether you're in the church, as we like to say, or if you're not in the church. Mankind goes through trials. Anybody here like to go through a trial? I think we would all just shudder and say, no. None of us like going through trials. None of us like having difficulties. At least if we're honest, we don't want to do that. We don't want to have to suffer. Who willingly stands up and says, yes, I will suffer? We don't like that. We don't want to do that. But yet we are told that part of our journey, what we will experience is going to be a certain level of trials. Some may have more than others. You know, there are some individuals, and probably at times I could be put into that category, uh, where we create our own trial. We can make a bad decision. God doesn't do anything. We just make a poor decision, and the consequences will follow us, and sometimes we have to work through a particular problem or difficulty. And that happens just by being human and not necessarily being as wise as maybe we should be. But as human beings, we are going to go through trials. Whether it's financial, uh, whether it's trials that uh, are, are predicated upon us keeping God's law, for example. Now, I was never, as in my work career, I never had to face the Sabbath as a trial. It always worked out for me, even uh, in, in my early years of working for a large accounting firm. Uh, they were very, very uh, accommodating. Uh, I made it a point that even during the busiest part of the year, which was typically toward the end of December and early January and February of the following year, what was a typical schedule for an employee at that particular time, especially those of us on the audit team, uh, was a six-day week, and it was Monday through Saturday, and sometimes on Sunday. And I went to my superiors early on, and I said, I do not work on the Sabbath. And of course, everybody has the inquisitive questions that come with that, and I explained why. And I said, but if I have to, I'm more than willing to come in after the sun goes down on Saturday, and I'll be here every Sunday, all day, if that's what it requires. And fortunately, the, the, the folks that I worked with at that time uh, were very accommodating. And the work that I was doing did not really hold up uh, the team that I was part of. And so there were many days during that busy season, or that busy time of the year, where I showed up at the office Sunday morning at 7.30 or 8 o'clock, and I was there till sometimes 6 or 7 in the evening. Uh, 
But I got my work finished, and they were quite um, accommodating and allowing me to do that. But as I said, I, you know, for me personally, I've never had that issue. But I know many in God's church have had the Sabbath as a trial. But I also know that so many stories I have heard from people who trusted that God would work it out, they ended up oftentimes, more times than not, in a better situation than they ever had before in going through that particular trial. If they lost their job, and I've, I've even heard stories where people were fired because of the Sabbath, and a day later, two days later, a week later, they were called up and said, would you consider coming back to work for us? And they've set a good example for people or employers to do that. But being in the church or out of the church, as I said, we're going to go through trials. Uh, some things are more specific to our uh, religious practices. Some things aren't. You know, health issues, health problems, uh, don't necessarily just strike God's people. They tend to strike all of humanity. And we can have those issues. We can have those, those battles that we go through. Or we can be a help giver to someone who's going through that. And in some cases, being that help person is almost as difficult as the individual who's going through the health difficulty themselves. I'm not saying it is, but it's, it's, it's a level of stress that can come upon individuals, and that can create quite a trial. So everyone is going to go through trials. And trials and tribulation is, that's, this is a subject we probably don't like to talk a whole lot about. But we're going to see as we go through the message this afternoon that, you know, God says a lot about this and the purpose of going through difficulties. You and I are called a first fruit. And it is an honor that's bestowed upon all of those individuals who God is working with now. Who has promised to be a part of the early harvest. Who has been promised a position in the family of God being servants, fellow servants with Jesus Christ, teaching and directing, being a part of a leadership team that's going to be uh, instrumental in bringing peace to the earth and bringing the knowledge of God throughout the entire world. You and I, as servants with Jesus Christ, are going to go through the millennium preparing those who survive but actually preparing for a much greater harvest that comes later. And there's a lot of work that will be done. And so God has given each one of us the honor of being called a first fruit. To be there, that promise, to be there in his family as a fellow servant with Jesus Christ. And the blessings we're told are immense for those of us who have the privilege of being called at this particular time. But what does God expect from me and you, those who he is working with now, and to those who have been given his spirit? What does he hope that our difficulties, our personal tribulations, and our personal trials will accomplish? Well, I can tell you he hopes that our faith is strengthened, he hopes we'll grow in patience. He hopes that we'll use his power. The power of his Holy Spirit to grow spiritually, to become wiser, become more mature, to become an individual that has and shows mercy, compassion. And he certainly hopes that each and every one of us will continue to be perfected in his character. Turn with me over to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And we'll look at a section of scripture here. Again, we're all familiar with this, but uh, Peter is lay laying out what many of us will be faced with and certainly laying out uh, the blessings that all of us are aware of. But in 1 Peter chapter 1, let's begin in verse, verse 3. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy 
has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. You know, and that hope, the Bible tells us, is to see Jesus Christ in his glory. And for us to have that part means that you and I are glorified spirit beings. But, con but continuing with verse 4, it says, it says, To an inheritance that is incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away. And it's reserved in heaven for you, for each one of us. And so we look forward to that day when this body is no longer in existence, but we have a body that's permanent, that will last forever, and that's perfect in every sense of the word. Verse 5, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time or at the last time. So here we see what God has promised to his people, those who are living now, certainly those that lived in the past, they're now asleep as the Bible says they are. But God has reserved a tremendous promise and a tremendous reward for each and every one of us. But notice how Peter continues with verse 6. Subject changes a little bit. But in verse 6 of 1 Peter 1, he says, In this you are to greatly rejoice. And again, that's all the things that were laid out in verses 3 through 5. It says, You greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, and if need be, you have been grieved by various trials. Well, I think it's safe to say that probably all of us, at some point, maybe many of us currently, uh, have gone through a trial or we are going through a trial. And so Peter tells us here that we're to rejoice knowing what God has put before us and that for a moment, if it's necessary, we have to go through a trial. Continuing in verse 7, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Peter tells us that we have an immense reward. But he also tells us too that part of that process, part of that journey, many of us will be impacted by personal trials that we have to go through, we have to work through, and we have to, in many cases, have to endure through. But our hope, as Peter has laid out, is that these are just for a moment. And if you think about those in light of eternity, how much time and space will they take up? Less than a snap of the fingers, less than a blink of an eye. And so our hope is that we're there to see Jesus Christ at his return, you and I, in glorified spiritual bodies. So trials and tribulations, they are, as the Bible tells us, they are an essential part of a Christian's walk they're an essential part of being a disciple of Jesus Christ. And we, as I said, probably none of us would volunteer for a trial. And no one that I know of really likes going through one. No one. But we're told that we will. It's not something that we look forward to, even though James does tell us that we are to count it joy. And when you're going through a trial, it can be difficult to say, well, this is a joyous occasion. But the meaning there, obviously, is that we understand that it's going to produce something, something that's invaluable, something that is a part of the perfection that God wants each and every one of us to go through. I don't like trials, you don't like trials, yet we're told that it is through trials and difficulties that you and I will go through as a part of the entrance into the kingdom of God. The Bible talks much about trials. and Every Christian is going to endure his or her share of those challenges. 
You know, God allows adversity to test us, to prove us. He allows it to encourage us in, in, a, in spiritual ways that we change. And he uses trials to help us spiritually mature. They're used to mold us. They're used to change our behavior. And as is laid out in many places in scripture, they are there to aid our spiritual growth as we become perfect. And we know that in this life we'll never be perfect. But the goal is to be on that road toward perfection. And so God uses trials to strengthen us, to test us, and to perfect us. So trials and faith, let me say this again, trials and faith are a combination that is seen often in Scripture. And so today, what I'd like to look at more closely is the relationship between trials that we go through and the growth that takes place in our spiritual journey that improves and strengthens our faith and I want to look at trials in terms of how God uses those to both perfect us and encourage us whenever we have to face a trial. Let me share with you a couple of quotes here. Actually, I think there's four. And these uh, are about, th these, are, these are quotes that I pulled together from individuals that I think you're going to recognize most of the names. But here's the first one. It said, every single experience, every single thing that happened in my life, struggle, obstacles, trials, tribulations, I think they've all molded me to become the character and the person who I am. That statement was made by Apollo Ono. Is that a name that's familiar, folks? He won a number of gold medals for speed racing a U.S. citizen. I think it was two Olympics ago. Uh, here's another one. What is life worth without trials and tribulations, which are the salt of life? Again, that quote is attributed to Gandhi. Mahatma Gandhi. Here's another one. The trials and tribulations in your life, those are the things that make you stronger. Who do you think said that? She's just finishing up a huge successful music tour. Taylor Swift. Trials and tribulations are the things in your life that make you stronger. Here's another one. The testing of your faith, it produces perseverance. Don't look at trials and tribulations as a bad thing. And again, the author of that one is unknown. And then finally, it says no one is exempt from trials and tribulations. In fact, this is often what happens to people who, who God loves. For it's a part of God's often mysterious and good plan for turning us into something that will be great. That's a quote from Timothy Keller. So you can see from individuals that some are more famous than others, certainly appreciated the benefit of what trials did to their personal character. And again, how much more should you and I appreciate knowing that it is the trials that we go through that perfect our character in a very spiritual way. Protect, perfecting our character to be more and more and more like God. Turn with me over to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. We recognize this as uh, the first chapter that we often refer to as the Sermon on the Mount. I'm not going to go through uh, any detail uh, scriptures here, but just other than pointing out uh, a summary that's found in 
verse 48. Matthew 5 and verse 48. He says, Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now when we see the word therefore, that is the conclusion of a lot of detail that goes on before it. So let me highlight or summarize what Christ had said before when he concludes this statement in verse 48 of therefore. In verse 21, he said, you, you heard said of old, you shall not murder. And then he goes on to talk about murder being equated with someone who hates someone. Verse 27, you've heard it said of old, you shall not commit adultery. And again, he points out the spiritual application of that command as well. In verse 31, marriage is binding and a sacred union before God. And we're told that God hates divorce. Verse 33, you have heard it said of old that you shall not swear falsely. Verse 38, you have heard it said of old, an eye for an eye. And again, we know that Christ pointed out that we're to show mercy, not seek revenge. Verse 43, and you've heard it said of old, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. And again, Christ points out that everyone is our neighbor and we're to hate no one. And then his summary is, therefore, verse 48, you shall be perfect just as your father in heaven is perfect. You know, Christ was teaching that there are spiritual applications that we go through and we must understand and follow that bring us closer and closer into the fullness of God's image. That we think and we act like our Father. You know, Christ was showing to his disciples and those who were gathered around him on this particular day that there is a spiritual intent behind God's law. That it has to be learned, it has to be followed, it has to be practiced. And certainly he, he was teaching that sin was of the heart and of the mind. And certainly it can happen with physical acts as well, but he was pointing out that sin begins in the heart and mind. And so God's people are, are to come to a fullness of understanding and obedience. And that fullness is embedded in our journey to become perfect. To become perfect. Let's turn over to 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3, and we'll look at a couple of verses here. 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 2, 1 John chapter 3, beginning in verse 2. John writes, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not been revealed what, what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him. For we shall see him as he is. You know, God says that we are children now. And so we are to act as God's children now. But the fulfillment of that, as we understand, happens at the return of Jesus Christ at the seventh trump. But John goes on in verse 3. He says, and everyone who has this hope in him purifies himself just as he, referring to Jesus Christ, is pure. So there is a quality that God desires out of all of his people before he will allow them to enter into his kingdom. We are to be molded, we are to be framed, and we are, be to, we are to be formed in his character to think like him, to react like him, and to live as he lives. We are to be complete in his image. Physically, we may resemble God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, and we know that we do. But to be complete is to have God's mind, his thoughts, and his character molded into us as individuals. We have to embrace those things. This kind of character has to be developed before God is going to allow anyone to receive the reward of eternal life. 
being a member of God's family, being a citizen of the kingdom of God. So what brings you and me to that perfection? How do we get there? You know, we could think about that for a long time. We know that we study, we pray, we meditate, we fast. We're to surround ourselves with the word of God, to live the word of God. But what really is going to bring us to that perfection that Christ has exhorted all of us to become? What will create the fullness, the completeness, the spiritual maturity? Well, it's the difficulties that we'll all go through. They shape our outlook. They impact our character. And they strengthen our faith. They deepen our faith in God. And so being an individual that God is working with, who's called to be a part of his family, it is part of the training process that God has put in place the trials that we will go through that help us to mature and go through this journey. Turn with me back to Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. Look at a couple of verses here. The author of Hebrew, no doubt Paul, was inspired to to make that we can learn from and be encouraged by. But in Hebrews chapter 12, beginning in verse 5, it says, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. You know, all of us, or at least for most, most of us, have no doubt had human fathers and mothers, and we have been chastened. And for some of us, that was a long time ago. Although, when my parents were alive, I still occasionally got chastened, even though I'm quite old. It's part of being a parent. But we've experienced that from our physical parents. But here, we are told that we are not to despise or to reject those times, those moments when we can be corrected or we can be rebuked, which is another word for correction, by our Father. Verse 6, For whom the Lord loves, he chastens, and he scourges every son whom he receives. So it is part of our journey. Verse 11, now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. And again, I can remember those moments when I was a small kid. You know, being chastened by my parents was not pleasant. And oftentimes it was painful. Fortunately, it only lasted for a moment. But here it says, no chastening, whether by our physical parents or by God himself, no chastening seems to be joyful at the moment, but it's painful. But Paul goes on to say, nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Or we could say to those who have been admonished or experienced through it. And so we see that part of our growth is correction and oftentimes correction can be and come through a trial that we go through uh, turn over to James or turn turn back or turn turn back to James for a moment James chapter 1 and I'm going to read uh, a couple of scriptures here in James 1 I'm going to read from the uh, New International Version but beginning in verse 2 of James chapter 1 James writes, he says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of any kind. And again, I referred to this earlier. Sometimes when you're going through it, it's hard to say or hard to believe or hard to consider that it's something to be joyous over. But he goes on in verse 3, he says, Because you know that the testing of your faith, it develops perseverance. And then perseverance must finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything. And then dropping down to verse 12, 
James tells us, blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Because when he has withstood the test, you know, when we've gone through it, when we've endured it, when we've had to learn those lessons or gone through those experiences, sometimes they soften us. Uh, sometimes it's what it takes to get our attention. Uh, sometimes it's what's needed. But it says, because when he has withstood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. So this is all pointing and working toward becoming a mature Christian, spiritually mature. You know, how will you and I face or endure a trial? How do you and I, as God's first fruits, go through the trials that we go through? And as the Bible clearly points out, we're going to have those that, we, that come upon us that we're going to have to face, that we're going to have to go through that process. We know that God gives us a tool, and that that tool is with us day and night, 24 hours a day. Turn back to John, John chapter 16. God gives us his power to help us face no matter what we have to face. But in John chapter 16, and in verse 7, we often read this on the evening of the Passover. But in John 16 and in verse 7, it says, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, that it is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send it to you. And again, we know that helper or comforter, it's an advocate. It's something to strengthen us, to soothe us, to raise our spirits, to give us power. It is, in fact, the very power of God. So the life of a Christian is going to include trials and testing. The life of a Christian is going to include difficulties that we have to battle. But God gives us his spirit and gives us his power to help us endure and to go through whatever is put before us. And we will see as we go through trials and as we, and as we reflect on things that we've had to face in our own individual lives, we can see how what we have gone through often will improve, strengthen, and allow us to become more and more obedient and more and more uh, loving, merciful, and compassionate children of God. I'd like to look at a couple of examples that uh, God has recorded for us. Uh, let's begin by going over to uh, Hebrews chapter 11. We know that's the faith chapter. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11, or over to Hebrews chapter 11, and look at a couple of verses here. Let's begin in verse 17 of Hebrews chapter 11. It says, By faith, Abraham, when God tested him, I'm reading from the New International Version, by the way. So God wasn't tempting him, but God was going to test him. Offered Isaac as a sacrifice. He who had received the promises was about to sacrifice his one and only son. Even though, verse 18, God had said to him, it is through Isaac that your offspring will be reckoned. And Abraham reasoned that God would raise the dead. And figuratively speaking, he did receive Isaac back from death. So that's a summary of what takes place back in a couple of chapters found back in Genesis. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 22. Genesis chapter 22. And I'm not going to read the full account. I think all of us are very familiar with this particular story. But each time we go and read through it and put ourselves in the shoes of Abraham, we should pause and think about what he faced. You know, here was a man that had had a personal relationship with God for 25, 30 years. A man that God had actually ate a meal with, spoken to him directly. But after God 
provided an heir that Abraham loved, God is going to test him. Let's begin in verse 1 of Genesis chapter 22. And it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham. And he said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. So as I said a moment ago, this is a number of years after God and Abraham had had a working relationship. God even referred to Abraham as his friend. So 30 years plus, they have this relationship. And yet God is going to test him. Verse 2. He says, said to him, now take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. Obviously, Abraham knew that it was against God's law to make a human sacrifice. So his mind must have been in a whirlwind when he got this news from God. What would he do? He knew it was wrong to kill. But yet, God is the one who told him. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, and he saddled his donkey, and he took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son went as well. He split the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place which God had told him. And then on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. 72 hours Abraham had to fight the mental battle of, will I kill my son? You know, sometimes we can read through that and just kind of, you read words on a page, you don't stop to think about what was Abraham going through? What would we go through mentally? Many of us have children would be an awfully difficult task if we were asked to slay one of our, our children. So Abraham had plenty of time to think this through. No doubt he was praying and talking to God, if not, if not verbally, certainly in his self-conscious and in his mind. But in, continuing in verse 5, And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and then we'll come back to you. Again, you know the story, what takes place. He, they build an altar, and Isaac realizes that he is the one that's to be sacrificed. And so picking up in verse 10, And Abraham stretched out his hand, and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, and he said, Abraham, Abraham. And so he said, Here I am. Then verse 12, And then he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad, or do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. You know, I, as I've read this scripture many times over the years, does God know everything about each and every one of us in terms of the decisions we will make? I'd say most of the time he does. But there are certain times, and this scripture seems to point out, that God really doesn't know. And so he put Abraham to the test. And then, as we see here in verse 12, now I know. What a trial. Can't believe what it would have been like to have been in Abraham's shoes. It's only for a small amount of time, wasn't it? Three days. But have you ever been through a lot of stress? Three days of stress can oftentimes be debilitating. But here God wanted to know what was in Abraham's heart. And he wanted to know for a fact what Abraham would do. And we know from this particular example that Abraham, his faith, his loyalty and his commitment was to God. And God wanted to know that. And he proved to God that his faith was genuine, his loyalty 
was permanent. And he was totally committed to God. Let's look at one other story. The story of Joseph. It's a very long, detailed story. The Bible records a lot uh, about what goes on with Joseph. The events that lead up to him being sold in Egypt. And the process that he goes through. And I'm not going to go through uh, and recap uh, verse by verse. But I'm just going to point out a few things that, that I want to address as we consider the story of Joseph. But Joseph, as a 17-year-old, happily skipping on his way to check on his brothers, that his father Jacob asked him to go and see. I will guarantee you that Joseph had no idea that morning what was going to befall him and what was going to happen to him that would impact his life for the rest of the days that he lived. Can you remember when you were 17? Happy? No, no worries. Everything's fun. No responsibility. So you can see Joseph heading down off the trail. You know, his father asked him to go see how the brothers were doing, how they were doing with the flocks. Here goes Joseph. What was going to happen? Well, we know, and he knew too, that his brothers were jealous of him, but certainly had no idea of what was going to take place to him. But we know he was sold to the Ishmaelites, and they in turn took him to Egypt, and he was sold to Potiphar, who was of the king's guard. And then we know what happened between Joseph, or what happened, uh, really, Potiphar's wife accusing Joseph, and we know what Potiphar decided to do to him. And so let's pick up this part of the story in Genesis 39 and verse 20. Genesis 39 and in verse 20. And then Joseph's master took him and put him into the prison, a place where the king's prisoners were confined. And he was there in prison. But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. Now there are a number of times through this particular uh, lengthy story of Joseph where we are told, I think it's at least five times where we are told or given the comment that the Lord was with Joseph. But Joseph probably didn't, in fact I know Joseph didn't understand fully what was taking place. So here he was thrown in prison. He was treated harshly, even though he was completely innocent of what Potiphar's wife had accused him of. He'd been falsely accused, and he's now thrown in prison. Hold your place here, and let's go back to uh, Psalms 105. Psalms chapter 105. There's an inset here. Uh, that recaps or gives us a little bit more insight into Joseph. So in Psalms chapter 105, beginning in verse 17, it says, He sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. And they hurt his feet with fetters. Now we just picked up that, this particular uh, section of the, of the uh, outline of Joseph's life back in Genesis 39. He was in prison. So he's in prison here as this psalm is referring to what he went through. So they hurt his feet with fetters. He was laid on in irons until the time that his word came to pass. The word of the Lord tested him. So clearly we see from what's recorded in Psalms that the process that Joseph would go through was a trial or a test for him that was brought upon him by God but for a much, much great and significant purpose that would take place in Joseph's life. So here we see in verse 19... The word of the Lord tested him. The New, Author the New Authorized Standard Bible 
it records this. The word of the Lord refined him. So Joseph was being tested, being refined. And back to, then back to Genesis chapter 20. Or, I'm sorry, Genesis 39. And the king sent and released him. I'm sorry. Continuing in verse 20 of Psalms. Psalms 105. Then the king sent and released him. The ruler of the people let him go free. He made him lord of his house and ruler over all of his possessions. And he made him to bind his princes at his pleasure and to teach his elders wisdom. So this is a summary that is found in Psalms chapter 105 that really summarizes the whole process that Joseph went through. But let's pick up the story back in Genesis chapter 41. Let's continue. Genesis chapter 41. Just look at a verse or two here. In verse 14 of Genesis 41, then Pharaoh, and again we know what led up to this, the baker and the butler, and when Joseph interpreted their dreams, he asked them to remember him, and so he was remembered two years later because Pharaoh had had a dream, and Pharaoh had called now Joseph to interpret them. So Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, verse 14 of Genesis 41, and they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, and he changed his clothing, and he came to Pharaoh. And so he proceeded to interpret the dreams of Pharaoh. Verse 46. Joseph was 30 years old when he stood before Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went throughout all the land of Egypt. Now that's a quick summary of 13 years. Because we're told that he was sold into slavery at age 17. Just a lad. Just a young boy. Just a teenager. Just starting life, really. And yet God had a tremendous purpose for him. And God was going to have to refine him, as Psalms tells us. Because Joseph was going to play a huge, huge role in the history of the peoples who would become Israel. So Joseph, now 30 years before Pharaoh, for 13 years he went through the trial. And he no, he no doubt understood, based upon what took place in prison, and certainly understood by now, that it was God who was leading him, encouraging him. But I will guarantee you that Joseph did not like the trial that he went through. But it was 13 years. And as I said at the beginning, imagine you're a 17-year-old skipping down the road to go see your brothers and all of a sudden this hits you square in the face. 13 years go by and now you're standing before Pharaoh and actually made second in command of the whole nation. But we're told that even the 13 years that Joseph had to endure that he never lost his faith in God. Even though there were times that no doubt his faith and his patience were put to the test. But in Genesis chapter 45, let's turn there quickly and we'll kind of summarize the story of Joseph. In Genesis 45, beginning in verse 5, it says, But now do not therefore be grieved or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. He's introduced himself or he's revealed himself to his brothers and they are reconciling. So he says, don't be angry or grieved for God sent me before you to preserve life. For these two years, the famine has been in the land and there are still five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvesting. And God sent me before you to preserve a posterity for you in the earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you who sent me here, but it was God. And he has made me a father to Pharaoh and the Lord of all of his house and a ruler throughout all of the land of Egypt. Quite a turnaround for a young man who on no doubt 
a clear and sunny morning, heading off to check on his brothers. And 30, I'm sorry, 13 years later, he's now the second in command of all of the nation of Egypt. You know, these are just two stories that I chose to look at today. There's many others. We could talk about Moses. We could talk about Joshua. Uh, what about Daniel? Did Daniel ever think that he would have to be thrown in a lion's den? And I could add others, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There's many others that went through that, that are, were men of God who God allowed certain things to happen to them to test them. Elijah is another one. And as we started off the sermon, how about Paul? We have a lot that's recorded in Acts about what Paul had to go through in his life. So there are many servants of God who went through tremendous trials, but it was to the benefit of their spiritual journey in being made perfect. Let's go back to Hebrews chapter 11. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, and we'll continue beginning in verse 32. It says, What more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and Barak and Samson and Jephthah, also of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, worked righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions, Verse 34, quench the violence of fire, escape the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, became valiant in battle, turned to fight the armies of the aliens. Verse 35, women who received their dead raised to life again. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. So that tells me that all of these individuals, not listed here by name, some are, that no matter what they faced, their focus and their eyes was on what God had promised. A better life, a place in his family, immortality. Verse 36, still others had trials of mockings and scourgings. Yes, and of chains and imprisonment. Again, we just read about one of those with Joseph. They were stoned, they were sawn in two. They were tempted or tested were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute and afflicted, tormented. Verse 38, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts, mountains, in dens and caves of the earth. Others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. Again, going through a litany of things that people faced, trials they went through, and yet they all had one thing in common. They looked for something better. They looked for a place in the family of God. They kept the vision. Verse 39, And all of these, having obtained a good testimony through faith, did not receive the promise. No, they've, They've all died. As the Bible says, they're asleep. They're waiting. Verse 40, God having provided something better for us. That's you and me that Paul is talking about here. That they should not be made perfect apart from us. So many of these individuals that are summarized here in verses 32 through 39 or, thir or th through 38, they face their trials. God used those difficulties, those tribulations, to mold them, to refine them, to improve them. And now they wait for that promise to be fulfilled. And as Paul is telling us here, you know, we're doing the same thing today. That God has offered us something much better than what this life can give. And that they are waiting as we go through the trials that we will go through. First Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4, 
Peter chapter 4, and let's begin in verse 12. It says, Beloved, do not think it strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try, or to test, or prove you, as though some strange thing has happened to you. But rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. You know, how do we partake of Christ's sufferings? Well, he was hated. He was despised. He was ultimately condemned to death for something that he was not guilty of. He lived a life that was different from those around him. And he endured things, suffered things, for which he was undeserving of. How many of us are going to go through that? ourselves at some point in time we don't know some things we may have to endure some things we also may have to go through and you know the bible tells us in revelation that many would be martyred for the word of god but continue on in verse 14 it says if you are reproached for the name of christ blessed are you for the spirit of glory and of god will rest upon you on their part he blasphemed but on your part he is glorified. But let, let none of you suffer as a murderer, or a thief, or an evildoer, or as a busybody in other people's matters. In other words, don't suffer because we sin. We know what sin is. Don't bring suffering upon ourselves because of committing sin. But in verse 16, yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, you know, and that's someone who's called by God, who lives a different life than those around them, around them live. But if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this matter. So we don't live in easy times. We live in this day and age, especially here in our nation, where things beginning to... I believe, reach a tipping point if they haven't already reached that point as it relates to morality and spiritual understanding, the basic rights and wrongs of life, common sense. Economically, we're a mess. How much longer will it be as we pray in their prayer, thy kingdom come? We don't know. We certainly hope it's soon. But you and I, no matter what we're faced with, no matter what happens in our society, you and I are not to lose heart. But you and I are to have even more passion and determination to move ahead, to forge ahead spiritually. Let's look at a couple as we begin to wrap. Let's look at a couple of encouraging scriptures, promises that we're given. First one's found in 2 Corinthians chapter 4. If you will, turn with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 4. And we'll notice what Paul gives to each one of us here. Beginning in verse 16 of 2 Corinthians chapter 4, it says, Therefore, we do, no, we do not lose heart, even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. And we don't. We don't give up. We don't quit. We don't lose heart in that sense. But going on in verse 17, he says, but for our, he says, for our light affliction, you know, whatever trials we go through, whatever difficulties, you know, Paul says they're comparatively speaking to the great scheme of life, knowing the promises and knowing the truth that we have. Whatever we go through refers to them as light affliction which is but for a moment, and they are working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we do not look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. And again, our focus is on what lies ahead that God has promised us. He's given us a great insight into his truth and into his word and he's given us the power through his holy spirit 
to be refined through his leadership, his direction, his testing. And as we know, he is going to make sure that all of us are perfected before we enter into his kingdom. Isaiah chapter 40. Let's go back to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 40. And let's begin in verse 28. Isaiah chapter 40, beginning in verse 28. It says, Have you not known, have you not heard, the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, he neither faints nor is weary. His understanding is unsearchable. Verse 29, he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might, he increases their strength. Even the youths, the youths shall faint and 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 be weary, and the young men, they shall utterly fall. Verse 31, but those who wait on the Lord, he shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with with wings like eagles, and they shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. You know, God is going to give us the strength and the power to forge ahead, to face whatever we are to face, and to go through whatever trial or difficulty comes upon us. Let's end by going to 1 Peter chapter 1. In 1 Peter chapter 1. And I'm going to read from the New International Version. But 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, says, For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold, that you were redeemed. But with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. Verse 20. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead, glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. You know, that's our focus. Our faith and our hope is in knowing that whatever we go through, it is for our benefit as our loving Father sees the things that we need. So let's remember that you and I have been called at this time for a very special calling. That God is preparing a people who He's going to use to work with Jesus Christ and reestablishing his government upon the earth, beginning to restore all things to him. We know we're going to be tested. We know the Bible clearly says that we'll be tested. We're going to be refined, because it is God who wants to know what is in our heart. And with each and every one of us, God is going to come to the point to where he can say, now I know. So let's pray for one another. Encourage one another. Be enthusiastic for one another. And knowing that whatever we go through, as Paul said, it's for a moment. And it's light. And in the context of eternity, it's nothing.